Well, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you if you're here with us in person. Uh, warm welcome. Great to see uh, those back with us uh, as well. And Lassie, Joseph and Melody, pleasure to have you with us. And uh, others who've been back after uh, away or been online, great to have you. And um, welcome to those online as well. Can you hear us online okay? Yeah, got some nods. That's great. Uh, we can see you've got Michael joining us online today and Jimmy and Alex and baby Moses. In fact, I can, I can see baby Moses sort of... Um, I'm not sure he's quite smiling, but he is, he is there anyway, joining in with us uh, remotely, so um, uh, that's great. Well, it is uh, a Sunday in the year that we traditionally call Palm Sunday, where we remember Jesus entering uh, into Jerusalem uh, as king. And let me read a few verses from John's Gospel about that. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. They praised him as king, but I don't think they really fully understood what his kingship meant, or indeed how great a king he was. But we have the privilege of knowing that he is that great king above all kings, that we can praise him for who he is and for all he's done. And we're going to do that in our uh, opening hymn. We're going to stand and sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please do sit down. Welcome to you to join us in the uh, last few minutes. It's great to have you with us today as we meet as the Honor at Christian Fellowship to praise the Lord together, to uh, come to him in prayer, to listen to his word, and to encourage one another. It's great to have you here with us. Uh, well, we're going to turn in prayer now to uh, the Lord.
I'm going to make sure people at home can hear. Uh, we're going to turn now in prayer to the Lord, and uh, Paul's going to come and lead us. Thanks, Paul. Father, we thank you for the account that we have written down for us of Palm Sunday and what happened, and the events that preceded it and the events that followed. We remember that the crowd cheered. Here was Jesus, a miracle worker, a teacher who spoke with authority, the prophet from Nazareth. Um, understand from John's account that they had been looking out for him, wondering when he might come to the feast. Thank you, Father, that you did not send your son into the world to entertain us. We ask that you will make us more than spectators, that you will cause us to give him more than a cheer as he goes by. Thank you that in the description of the meal at Bethany, um, we're told that Martha served. We remember that this is something we've been told about before. This is Martha in default mode. Someone had to do it. She had standards and a reputation, so she served. Father, we thank you for Martha's service. But we remember that Jesus said that there was a better thing. And we ask that in all of our serving, you will keep us from losing sight of the one we wish to honor in our service. Father, we thank you for this amazing account of Mary's offering, Mary's devotion. He was the one who had sat at Jesus' feet listening to his teaching, and he had confirmed that there was nothing more important. She had chosen the better thing. We thank you that in this act of pouring out the perfume, she shows the value that she placed upon your son. We thank you that in one extravagant act of worship, she poured out this expensive perfume, something transient, but something which expressed the value she placed upon him. This is your beloved son. We ask that you will help us to listen to him and to recognize his worth. Father, we remember that all of this took place because Jesus obeyed. He had set his face towards Jerusalem. He was going to play his part in all that had been prophesied about the Messiah. He did not look for a way out. He did not attempt to frustrate your plans or to postpone them. Rather, he made it his goal that he would play his part. We pray that you will help us to respect your commands, to respect your purposes, whether they are welcome to us or not. We pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, thanks so much, Paul, for uh, leading our prayers. Well, we're going to uh, turn to listen to God's Word now and our Bible reading. Uh, if you've got a Bible, you might like to turn to uh, John chapter 12. If you, if you haven't got a Bible that would like one, uh, then there's a little supply at the back so we can uh, supply with you one if you want one. If you get a little wave, I'm sure Paul would uh, pop one in your hands. Anybody who wants one who hasn't got one, uh, we'll do that. Excellent. And uh, Daly's going to come and very kindly read a passage for us. Thanks, Daly. This passage of God's Word is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, starting at verse 1 to 19. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 12, 
verses 1 to 19, found on page 1079 in your church Bible. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found the young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they have heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look what the whole world has, look, the whole world has gone after him. Great, thanks so much uh, for reading for us, David. And we're going to be thinking about that passage together a bit later in our time together this morning. Well, we're going to sing again now. As we were hearing in that uh, reading, sometimes, like on Palm Sunday, the crowds were cheering for him and praising him. In the words of his next hymn, it says, they strew his way. They kind of threw palm branches and things in front of him. But of course, he was coming to die, and that's what we, what we recognize. And we uh, are going to sing about in this hymn. So we'll stand and sing together, My Song is Love Unknown.
do sit down. Great words to sing, aren't they? Great words to remind us. Great words reminding us of all that Christ did for us. And even as he rode in on the palms that first uh, uh, occasion, on, we remember on this Palm Sunday, he was riding in to die, to give his life for those like us. Again, let me welcome you. It's great to have you uh, here with us this morning. Uh, at the end, please don't dash away. There'll be tea and coffee over here. It's quite sunny. You can even spill into the garden and enjoy the, the garden as well if you, if you would like to. There's the Explorers group for those uh, uh, roughly 3 to 11-ish um, uh, during the service this morning as well. So they'll be heading out in a few minutes. Uh, I'll say when. Uh, this evening and next Sunday evening, we're going to uh, be in John's Gospel for the two sort of special Easter Bible studies. This evening, we're particularly thinking about John's account of the crucifixion. Uh, so do, do join us for that on Zoom this evening if you can. So 6.30 this evening on Zoom. Uh, just forewarning that uh, a fortnight today, so uh, not Easter Sunday, but the Sunday after, we're intending to have our Sunday evening meeting in person here. Now, we'll also sort of set up a, a Zoom relay so you can join if you aren't, aren't able to come in person on Sunday evening. Um, but there will be an in-person meeting on Sunday evening, two weeks today. So hope you can join us for that if you can, again at 6.30. Uh, it being the uh, Easter holidays, we've not got our regular midweek meetings this week, so they're on hold until the following week. Uh, but of course, we do have our Good Friday service, uh, which is coming up at 11 o'clock on Good Friday as in the last few years, it's going to be joined with a number of other local churches. So uh, all being well, we should have lots of us here together uh, as Christians united in, in praising the Lord, listening to his word and thinking about Jesus' death for us. So do come, if you can, this Good Friday, 11 o'clock. And so we trust that hopefully we should fill quite a lot of the space with all those joining us. Then Easter Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, we'll be back here uh, for our Easter Sunday morning service as well. So please do join us for whatever you can this, uh, this uh, Holy Week. Um, if you've got some time in the next few days, uh, we've got lots of these little invitation cards that we'd like to put through the doors of people in the surrounding area. If you happen to have a, a spare hour or so and you're someone who's you know, able to walk and deliver, deliver things, then it'd be great if you could deliver a few of these leaflets through some of the nearby houses. We've got a list at the back there so you can see which roads haven't been done yet. If anyone feels able to you know, spend a bit of time this week doing that, that would be a great help. Uh, so we'd love to invite lots of other people in our community to join us and to hear this great message uh, of Easter uh, this coming weekend. Wonderful. I think they're the things to catch us up on. Well, we're going to turn now to the road to the cross. Uh, now, usually George has done this, but George is away, so I'm afraid you've got to, you've got to put it with me, substituting for George this morning. But we're going to be thinking today about the, uh, the last part of this journey uh, to the cross. I'm particularly thinking this, evening, this morning about the Last Supper. So, on the night before Jesus died, he uh, met with his uh, disciples uh, for a special meal. It wasn't just an ordinary meal, it was a special Passover meal. And he met with them and they had a meal together. And during the meal, he gave a particular significance to the bread and the wine. The bread and the wine were already part of the meal that they'd have each, uh, each Passover, but he gave a special significance that we're going to think about. But that meal is a Passover meal that looks back in time to the Passover that happened in the Old Testament, all the way back in the book of Exodus, uh, hundreds of years before Jesus. Uh, and um, in that Passover meal... What had to happen is the people had to go and get a lamb. So hopefully, here we go. They go and get a lamb. And they take the lamb, and the lamb comes and lives with them in their house for a few days. And then after that, uh, they have to do something special with the lamb. You might remember that the Israelites at this time, they were in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt. And God has sent ten plagues so that they'd be freed and sent out of Egypt. And the tenth plague was going to be uh, the death of the firstborn sons. But God made a way that the firstborn sons of the Israelites could be rescued from that uh, through uh, a lamb given in their place. So each family, therefore, to look after their firstborn son, has to get themselves a lamb. They take the lamb home, and on the particular day they're told, 
they then kill the lamb uh, and they put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, uh, like that, signifying that uh, the lamb has been killed in that house. And then they, eat, they roast the lamb and eat the meal together inside the house uh, with the blood over the doorposts. And in the houses where they've done that, God's judgment passed over those houses. God's judgment passed over, death passed over, and so the firstborn sons were saved. And through this, God rescued his people, both from the judgment of that plague and from slavery in Egypt, and released them to be his people. And that was remembered all the way through Israelite history, a bit up and down at times. Uh, but in Jesus' day, lots of people came to Jerusalem to remember what had happened. And again, to eat a, a lamb together that had been killed, and to have a meal with bread and wine and other elements to it. And this meal was pointing to the fact that Jesus was like that Passover lamb, that he was going to die in place of people. He was going to make a substitute for the people. And that his death was going to mean that God's judgment would pass over his people, and that God's people would be free from death, from sin, and to be his people. And as part of the meal, he took the bread and the wine and gave them a special significance. So he took the bread and said, this bread is going to represent my body. Think about Jesus. His life was lived to honor God all the way through. But then at the end, he gave his body to be broken uh, in order to save people. So as the bread was broken, it reminded them that Jesus, uh, Jesus' life lived for God has then been broken in death to save us. Similar wine uh, was like Jesus' blood poured out as a way of rescuing us, of our sins being forgiven. So Jesus gave this significance to the bread and the wine at this last meal with his friends, at this Passover meal, pointing not only looking back to the, the way they've been saved in their past, but to the way that God was about to save them through Jesus' death. And Jesus said to keep doing this, and that's why most Sundays, uh, when we meet together, we, we have the Lord's table. We have bread and wine, remembering Jesus' body given uh, and broken, his life lived for God, and body broken in death, his, his blood poured out to save us, to forgive us. So that was the night before Jesus died, and he explained what was about to happen in his death. Something that we remember today, and remember almost every Sunday we do the same meal, remembering what he has done. Well, after that meal, then Jesus' disciples, they go out. They go to a place called the Mount of Olives, lots of olive trees on a hillside. Jesus prays. He asks God if there's another way, then could they go the other way? But he says that he will submit himself to the Father's will. And that's what he does. And soon after that, he's arrested and tried and killed. So we've been thinking these past weeks about this road to the cross. And here we are. Uh, at the Last Supper, just before the cross, pointing ahead to that final element, to Jesus' death on the cross. Well, with that in mind, why don't we, uh, why don't we pray for a moment, and then we're going to sing again. Father God, we thank you for all we've seen about Jesus' life on the road to the cross. Lord, as we've been thinking this evening about that final meal, uh, that Passover meal, where Jesus was showing that he was going to be like the Passover lamb given to save. Lord, we thank you. He explained how the bread and the wine were going to signify what he was about to do. His body, his life lived for you, given in death, broken in death. His blood uh, shed to save us. Lord, we thank you so much for that. And so we pray that when we see the bread and the wine on the table, when we hear this account, we'll be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. And we'll be caused to trust in him and to keep trusting in him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I remember, of course, that all these things were showing God's great love for us. The love of God the Father, the love of God the Son. And we're going to sing of God's love now in this next hymn. So we'll stand and sing, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Only son. 
sit down. Great to remember God's great love for us. Well, it's time now for Explorers. So if you're one of the Explorers, this is your moment. Uh, go and uh, follow uh, Lizzie and David off down to Explorers. Trust you'll have a good time looking at God's Word together. And um, that's what we intend to do here as well. We're going to spend some time in God's Word. Uh, so you might want to turn back to that passage in John chapter 12. If you haven't got a Bible, you might like to, to, to grab one. And uh, also got a little handout showing you roughly where we're going. If you'd like a handout as well, Bible or handout, get a little wave and um, Paul will supply your needs. Thanks, Paul. Excellent. Let's, uh, let's pray and particularly ask the Lord to help us in this part of our time together, shall we? Father God, we do thank you that you've given us your word that we don't have to guess about you, but you've spoken to us. Lord, we pray that as we read and think on this passage this morning, you'll speak to us through your words, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit will take your word and apply it to our hearts, that we'll understand its truth, and that we'll live in the light of what it says. We pray you might do this to your praise and glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, for part of our time at least, we're going to think about a woman here in this passage who was devoted to Jesus, someone who was devoted to him. I think it causes us to ask ourselves, are we devoted to Jesus? Are we devoted to Jesus? Now, you come across people in life who are devoted to all sorts of things, don't you? You've probably met them. There are all sorts of things they might be devoted to. Some people, for example, are devoted to their football club. Now, I'm originally from Derby, 
So my sort of home football club is Derby County. And I do keep a bit of an eye on what's happening with them. This season, I've been sort of following their attempts to find something to buy the club, which may have just about worked, and their attempts not to get relegated, which probably haven't worked. Um, but if I'm honest, I'm a far from devoted supporter. Yeah, I have been to the stadium, the old stadium, 25 years ago probably now. But apart from the manager, I would struggle to tell you many of the people involved. Oh, yeah, I'm interested in Derby County, but my commitment level is pretty low. They're definitely my team, you know. I shout, come on the Rams, very quietly occasionally. But in practice, I only take a very passing interest in what they do. I guess the challenge for us this morning, uh, for you, for me, is what does our commitment to Jesus Christ look like? Is it like the devotion and love of Mary in our Bible passage this morning, or is it more like my commitment to Derby County? Are we devoted to Jesus? Well, this passage this morning will also show us who Jesus is. It will show us what he's done for us. So it will give us really good reasons why being devoted to him is the right thing and a good thing to do. It will hopefully motivate us towards that devotion. And I've put the big idea on the sheet there for you. So if you're going to hold on to the big idea, this is it. Jesus is God's promised king who comes to bring life and peace through his death. So be devoted to him. Jesus is God's promised king who brings life and peace through his death. So be devoted to him. So John chapter 12, on page 1079 in the church Bibles. Verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, this first verse contains two important clues to what's happening in this passage and the passages around it. The first is a mention of Lazarus. Now, did you notice, and not only does it say where Lazarus lived, not only mentioned by name, but we're reminded that he is the one whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Indeed, three times in that passage that David read for us, are we reminded that Lazarus was the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead? John is very deliberately reminding us of what we saw last week, that Jesus brings life. Do you remember Lazarus? He'd died, he'd been dead and buried in the tomb for four days. But then Jesus came to the tomb, he spoke, he called the man out, and he was raised to life and, and walked out of the tomb. Jesus brings life. Life now and life for eternity. John wants us to remember that as we begin this account. The other important clue to what's happening here is John's mention of the Passover. The Passover which is only a few days away. We remembered a bit about the Passover, didn't we, a few moments ago when the children were here with us. The Passover festival celebrated God's great saving work in the Old Testament. Remember the Israelites, they were slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, refused to let them go. So God sent ten terrible plagues on Egypt to make Pharaoh let the Israelites go. And the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn sons. Across Egypt, every firstborn son, animal and person, was going to die. It would be a judgment on Pharaoh and a judgment on the sort of supposed gods of Egypt. But God made a way for the Israelites to be saved from that plague. They could take a lamb, live with them for a few days. Then on the Passover day, they, they killed the lamb, put the blood on the doorposts, uh, ate the lamb in a meal together with the family in the house, and then God's judgment would pass over those houses. Death would pass over those houses. The lamb's death was instead of the firstborn son's death. And through this, the Israelites were saved both on God's judgment and also from slavery in Egypt, to be freed to be God's people. We've seen some of the next part of the story in our Numbers series recently. Well, that great event was remembered each year in Jerusalem. Each year again, a lamb would be killed for each, each household, and they would eat uh, their meal together. As the account unfolds here, 
it becomes clear that Jesus is going to die. He's going to die like that Passover lamb. He's going to die in order to save people. So even in this first verse, we see those two big ideas hinted at. We see that Jesus brings life, and that in order to do so, he's going to die. He's going to die like the Passover lamb. Well, well, let's get back to the story. We're told that Jesus returned to this village, to Bethany, where Lazarus lived with his two sisters, Martha and Mary. And verse 2, Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour, Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So here they are, eating at the table in the sort of usual fashion, they're reclining as they eat. And alongside Jesus at this table is one Jesus that's raised from the dead. What a remarkable meal this must have been to be at. But then Mary does something unexpected and amazing, something extravagant showing her great love, her great devotion to Jesus. Verse 3, Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary took this expensive perfume. Later we're told that it was worth about 300 denarii, about a year's wages for somebody who was a sort of day labourer, 300 days' worth of labour. I guess we could say, you know, maybe £30,000 today, something like that. A, a very large sum of money. And she takes this very valuable perfume and she pours it on Jesus and onto his feet. And the house is filled with the smell of this great perfume. And she takes her hair and she uses her long hair to, to wipe his feet. An act of immense love and devotion, isn't it? And a very costly devotion at that. It was very costly because of the cost of this perfume. And it's costly because some of the people watching weren't all that impressed. It's costly because uh, what she saw as devotion might have meant other people disapproved of her. Here we see Mary's costly devotion to Jesus. And I guess I raise the question, doesn't it? Am I devoted to Jesus? Like Mary here. See, it'd be possible to come along to church for all sorts of reasons. All sorts of reasons that aren't necessarily Jesus. You might come because you, you know, like the experience or the friendship or the coffee or whatever it might be. But the Christian faith is centred on Jesus, on commitment and love for him. Is Jesus the centre of your faith? Or is it something else? Perhaps going to church, living a good life, caring for others. All good things, of course, but they're not the centre of the faith. Jesus must be the centre. And if we are committed to Jesus, is that commitment at least in some ways, echoing this devotion that we see here. Do we love Jesus as Mary does? Mary doesn't think or worry about the cost, does she? She doesn't, she doesn't care about the fact that people watching are going to disapprove. She's devoted to Jesus. Do we have a devotion to Jesus like that? Are we willing to be devoted to Jesus, even if the people watching around us don't like it very much? As we look through this passage, we'll hopefully see more of why Jesus is someone we should be devoted to, someone we should look to, to in love and devotion. We're called to be like Mary, be devoted to Jesus. Well, not everyone is pleased with what Mary's done. In particular, Judas complains about the waste. We see this in verse 4. One of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. 
on the face of it, Judas's objection here sounds very pious, doesn't it? It sounds very spiritual. Wasn't this a waste? Couldn't the money have been better spent? You know, the needs of the poor were there. Why, why spend all this money on this perfume for Jesus? Well, John reveals that Judas's motives were far from pure in saying this. We're told he was the group treasurer. If you can imagine, he was the person who kept the money for the group uh, and looked after it. Uh, but we're told that Judas happily helped himself to some of the money in that shared money bag. You see, Judas had too high a view of money and too low a view of Jesus. In his mind, money in his pocket was much better than money spent on Jesus. I guess the thing is, we don't need to be a thief uh, like Judas to fall into a little bit of Judas's way of thinking. It's quite possible to hold back on devotion to Jesus, whether in money or time or service or whatever it might be, and to think, well, it's, it's very sensible, isn't it? I, I need to hold that back and be a bit more sensible. Perhaps sometimes if we examine our heart, we need to wonder whether those, that's actually shown that those things are more important to us than Jesus. That perhaps our view of Jesus is too small. Well, Jesus defends Mary here. And not only does he defend her, but he reveals there's a deeper purpose in her act. That it's preparing for his burial. Now, there's no particular indication that Mary understands this. I think she was just acting to be devoted to Jesus, to out of love for Jesus. But she acted better than she knew. Verse 7, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. Jesus says this anointing with perfume is a sort of preparation for his death and burial. That this act of Mary's was somehow especially appropriate now because he was about to go to his death. Jesus quotes from the Old Testament here when he talks about the fact that there will always be the poor among you. I think his point is something like this. You know, there's always going to be poor people and it's right that you look after them and care for them. You, you know, feel free to do that. But... I, Jesus, am only here for a short while. And this act of devotion is especially appropriate now. That it's right that Mary shows this act of devotion to Jesus. Think about it. It's slightly odd that Jesus is talking about his death, isn't it? Think about the meal. Here you are, the meal with these people, and among the people at the table is Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. And you think, well, Jesus is saying he's going to die. But that sounds really odd, doesn't it? Because Jesus has shown he's got power over death. There's sort of living proof sitting in the room with you. So why is Jesus going to die? Well, the wider context of this passage explains this for us. A few verses back in chapter 11, verse 50, we get an explanation. A chap called Caiaphas, he's the high priest, and he speaks better than he knows. He, he doesn't intend it in a spiritual sense, but... What he says is true. So what he says, you do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And John comments, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. See, Jesus is going to die for the sake of others, to save and rescue others, to bring life to others. Jesus' death is actually going to be the way that he brings that life. Jesus brings life through his death. One of the many reasons, like Mary, we should be devoted to Jesus. Well, the next day, Jesus goes into Jerusalem on other occasions when we hear Jesus going to Jerusalem, he often does so quietly, uh, privately. But on this occasion, he does so very openly. And the crowds wave palm branches and they shout. So here in verse 12, the next day the great crowd that had come for the feast 
heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They welcome Jesus, quoting some words from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, and they welcome him as the promised king, as a promised king of Israel, this promised Christ or Messiah. The word Hosanna, it literally means sort of save or, or save, save now. But it was kind of used as a sort of exclamation of praise. On the lips of these crowds as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, when they shout Hosanna, it seems to be both praise and them indicating that's what they want Jesus to do. They want Jesus to save them. But probably their idea of what that saving looked like is quite different to what Jesus was actually going to do. Most probably, they thought that Jesus would come and get rid of the Romans and rule like the great kings of the Old Testament. He'd rule like Solomon or David over the great kingdom of Israel. That isn't what Jesus is coming to do. Now, in part, this is shown by his choice of transport. He doesn't enter Jerusalem on a, you know, a great war horse or, or perhaps an exotic elephant that he sort of brought along for the purpose, something like that. He enters on a, on a donkey. If you go into central London, sometimes you can sort of see, you know, when the um, sort of mounted um, uh, soldiers go around, they sort of go between different barracks or whatever, you, and you see them, they're on these big horses, and they're in that full regimental sort of kit, and they look very, very imposing, and you think, I don't think you wouldn't want to get in the way of these kind of people on horses. It'd be very scary. It's a very impressive sight, isn't it? They're making a very clear message. That's not the message that Jesus chose. Instead, he rode a young donkey. Perhaps in itself, that implied he wasn't a kind of conquering king that the crowds might expect. But there's actually a much deeper significance in this choice of a donkey. John tells us this is not something really the disciples grasped at the time, but it's something they realized later. Only afterwards did they realize the full significance. And we're told about it there in verse 14 onwards. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's cart. John quotes from the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, and it confirms that Jesus is a king. As he, as he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, he, he's coming as God's king. Uh, Zion is a sort of poetic uh, use for Jerusalem uh, in, in passages like this. Jesus is coming as God's promised king. But the prophecy in Zechariah tells us even more about what this king would be like. I'm going to read a few verses from uh, Zechariah 9 and uh, 10. Sorry, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. I'll put the reference on the sheet for you if you want to uh, follow it up later. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he comes as a king, but he comes as a humble king riding on a donkey. And he comes to bring peace. Peace to God's people. Peace to the world under his rule. So as Jesus takes his donkey, as he rides into Jerusalem, he's confirming that he's God's promised king, that he's come to bring peace, peace with God, peace for God's people. And ultimately, in the future, there will be peace for all under Jesus' rule. Jesus is God's promised king, come to bring peace. So as we bring these pieces together that we've seen through this passage, uh, we get to where we started. Jesus is God's promised king who brings life and peace through his death. 
He's the king God's promised. And this king is going to bring life, just like he brought life to Lazarus, so he's going to bring life to all those who look to him and trust in him. And he's going to bring peace, as this prophecy from Zechariah tells us. Jesus is king, and he's coming into Jerusalem, but not exactly to get crowned, at least not in the way you might expect. He's not going to get crowned in a sort of lavish ceremony with a, a golden crown on his head on a throne. His coronation, if you like, is going to be his death on the cross. That's when he's going to be declared God's king. And much like the way the death of the Passover lamb saved God's people from judgment and freed them from slavery in Egypt, Jesus' death will rescue God's people from sin and death, bring them life and peace with God. So how should we respond to this Jesus? This amazing king who's come to rescue people like you and me, come to bring us life if we will trust him. Surely our response should be something like that response of Mary, a response of devotion to Jesus. Many people in the world are devoted to all sorts of things, aren't they? You've probably met some of them, seen some of them on the television, online. People are devoted to a sport or their sports team or to hobbies or to work or to collecting something or other. All sorts of things people are devoted to, to achievement, sometimes to those they love. Well, we're called on to love and be devoted to Jesus. I wonder if we step back from our life, if you or I, we step back from our life and we looked at our life and we examined it, would we see in that life a devotion to Jesus? Not just a bit of Christian practice, good though that is, but would we see devotion? Not just a sort of half-hearted commitment, like my sort of Derby County following, half-hearted doesn't really mean very much. But would we see in our life a devotion to Jesus, a love for him, a heart that wants to live for him and serve him? As we see again this morning, who Jesus is and what he has done for us. I hope this will spur us on to want to have that wholehearted commitment to him. Want to be devoted to him like Mary in love. That one who is our great king and saviour. Jesus, God's promised king, who brings life and peace through his death. So be devoted to him. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for who your son is and all that he did in his earthly life. Father, we thank you in particular that Jesus, your great king, came to bring us life and peace through his death. We thank you as willing to go to a death on the cross in order to bring us peace with you, to bring us life before you, Father, we pray that those great truths will grasp our hearts and minds more and more. And Father, we pray that in response, we'll be devoted to him. Lord, we pray that we might echo something of Mary's devotion and our lives might be committed to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again now of uh, Jesus, of what he has done. We're going to be amazed as we look at what he did as he went to the cross. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing together, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Jesus the the Nazarene.
down. Welcome to the part of our service where we are going to be around the Lord's table, focusing on Jesus' death uh, for us. thought a little bit already in our service about what this meal signifies. We thought about how Jesus lived that perfect life to honor God, but then died on the cross, his body broken for us. We thought about how his blood was shed to bring us forgiveness and life. So if you're someone here this morning and you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if he's a person who you recognize as being the saviour that you need and the one who is Lord of your life, then I would welcome you, encourage you to join with us in this meal of bread and wine. If that's not you yet, if you couldn't yet say that, then just let the wine and bread pass you by, but we hope in the future you will join us. Uh, during this kind of COVID period, uh, the, the bread is a little like the top of these little cups. So you take off the top layers, a little bit of wafer bread. Um, when we've all been served, we'll pray together, then we'll eat the bread together, and there'll be a little pause, and then um, we'll pray again, and then drink the wine together. It's all in these little self-contained little cups uh, at the moment. Well, perhaps I'll read from Matthew's Gospel and his account of the Last Supper and the beginning of the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. Gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let me pray and then I'll, we'll bring the bread and wine around. Father God, we thank you so much for what we read here of what Jesus said, how this bread and wine pointed to his saving death. Lord, we pray as we uh, join in this meal together now in obedience to his commands, we too might be not only physically fed with a small bit of bread and wine, but spiritually fed as we grasp again, and we grasp in a fresh way what Christ has done for us, as we remind of this great work for us. Lord, we pray you might be at work in us, as we take this bread and wine together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
do thank you for uh, Jesus' death for us, his blood shed for us. Lord, we thank you that this wine is to us this reminder, this sort of visual taking on board of what he has done for us. That he poured out his blood for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that that's true for us if we're trusting in Christ this morning. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father God, we pray that having been reminded again of all that Christ has done for us, of all that he's done to save us and rescue us and to make us your people. Lord, we pray that therefore we'll go out and live as your people. Lord, as your forgiven people, help us to live increasingly for you. Lord, we pray you'll help us to live increasingly with lives that are refined and changed, that agree more and more with what you would have us do. Lord, we pray you'll help us to do that to your praise and glory. And Lord, as we meet together here around the table, Lord, we also remember those who for different reasons aren't able to be with us or perhaps who are unwell or who are struggling. Lord, we would bring them to you particularly. Lord, we would pray for Doug and Olive, uh, both in uh, less good health these days. Lord, we do pray that even though they can't be with us here this morning, that you might be with them, that they'll be very conscious that you're with them and that they may be looking to you together this morning. Lord, we pray for those who have been unwell, who are recovering. Lord, we do pray for Michael Johnston as he recovers at home. Lord, we do pray for Alex and John and Moses as they uh, get used to being a a little family together, Lord, and uh, uh, recover from the sort of uh, uh, events of the birth and uh, uh, grow together as a family. Lord, we do commit them to you. Lord, we'd also pray, Lord, for those who are in a time of sadness or bereavement at the moment. Lord, we particularly would pray for for Paul and uh, for his family following the recent death of his mother. Lord, we pray that you'll bring him and the rest of the family your help and your comfort at this time. Lord, please help them in the midst of this uh, great period of sadness. Lord, we pray for these and for many others perhaps known to us uh, who are going through hard times at the moment. Lord, we pray that they and we might look to you. Lord, we pray that this great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ might shape our thinking, that it might cause us to look to you for, for help and for comfort. And Lord, we pray that all times and perhaps particularly hard times might cause us to depend even more upon you. Lord, please help us in this, we ask. Lord, we also ask that you'll help us as a church fellowship to love one another in a way that reflects something of your great love for us. Help us with a means of care for one another in in ways that we can. So, Lord, we ask all these things and commit all these things to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our final hymn is a hymn of uh, commitment, of desire that we would be focused and committed to the Lord Jesus, that he would uh, form our, our thinking and what we would want. So we're going to stand and sing together, Be Thou My Vision. Save that thou art, thou my best. 
stand a final prayer. Joining with Paul's prayer for the Ephesians as we pray this for ourselves. And we pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.